Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the worship of God on this fifth Sunday of Easter as we continue to celebrate our Lord's resurrection from the dead in order to bring us forgiveness and new life. I wanted to announce to you that there are some prayer concerns. Um, I've added the family of Anna Childers to the prayer list today. Um, Anna was a relation to Cliff and Ruby Hefner who died this past week. So, And also uh, Donna Roberts, I think, who is a neighbor to this congregation. Yes. She is that right correct? Next door. She lives right next door. She's had some health concerns as well. So uh, I've added her to our prayer list today. We welcome all to worship. I think we're going to get some instruction. Are you going to do that? Yeah, please do. Yes. Yeah, just a reminder, and, and for those of you who may not have been here before, uh, just a couple of little things I wanted to point out. Uh, when we share the piece, we use American Sign Language to do that, and the American Sign Language for Peace Be With You is hand over hand, and then you switch, and then you part the water, so to speak. So literally that means together, we're still, we're at peace. So peace be with you also with you. And for communion, the ushers will leave you, but we will come about four or five at a time up to the front, and the ushers will, again will tell you when. And you'll receive communion. We do use the little cups and the wafers. When you finish your cup, you'll end up putting it back into the tray and then just stay in place as a group until the pastor blesses you and then just return to your seats around the outside. And I believe that's all I have for instructions. So let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held. Thank you. 
please stand now for the brief word for confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and solely by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, you teach us that without love, our actions gain nothing. In this gathering, pour into our hearts your most excellent gift of love, that made alive by your Spirit, we may know goodness and peace through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson is from the 11th chapter of Acts. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why do you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men, sent to me from Caesarea, arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he has said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Here is the reading. Thanks be to God. Today's Psalm is Psalm 148. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise God in the heights. Praise the Lord, all you angels. Sing praise, all you hosts of heaven. 
Praise the Lord, sun and moon. Sing praise, all you shining stars. Praise the Lord, heaven of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord who commanded, and they were created, who made them stand fast forever and ever, giving them a law that shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and fog, tempestuous wind, doing God's will, mountains and all hills, fruit tree, trees and all cedars, wild beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, sovereigns of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the world, young men and maidens, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, whose name only is exalted, whose splendor is over earth and heaven. The Lord has raised up strength for the people and praise for all faithful servants, the children of Israel, a people who are near the Lord. Hallelujah. The second reading comes from the 21st chapter of Revelation. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Here in Serene. Thanks Thank be to God. God. Would you please stand for the reading of the Gospel? The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 13th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. <clears throat> when Judas had gone out, Jesus said, now, now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am only with you a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you O Christ. Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from him who was, who is, and who is yet to come again, Jesus, the living Christ. Amen. Today I'm going to focus on the passage in the book of Acts. That particular passage captures a pivotal event in the life of the church. And from this text, the character and the future of the church was determined. It is that important of what occurred to Simon Peter and the changes that were brought about. I believe that uh, this text is still pivotal for the church today. Dr. Seuss, let's go to the theologian Dr. Seuss here, in Green Eggs and Ham, echoed much of what Peter taught and believed. As uh, I will not eat them in a boat, I will not eat them with a goat, I will not eat them here or there. I will not eat them anywhere. I do not like them, Sam I am. <laughs> well, there were some things Peter would eat, some things that he would not. And it was not because he necessarily disliked them. There were laws against them. And Peter, being a keeper of the law, was going to be sure that he followed those laws. He believed in the limits. He believed in the validity, the biblical basis of the Jewish dietary laws. And they were spelled out quite clearly in Leviticus chapter 11 and also in Deuteronomy 14. If you want to take a look at those, uh, you, could, you could see what those restrictions were. 
these restrictions uh, helped define a people. It helped, uh, helped them to stay together, it defined who they were and how they lived and how they behaved. And it saw them through the destruction of Jerusalem, the exile in Babylon, and all the pressures under the Roman occupation. Uh, all those pressures to become assimilated into the pagan world. Peter believed you are what you eat. You must be careful with whom you eat. You know, the speech, the, his talk there of eating with uncircumcised believers, Gentiles. And the laws told you what to eat and what not to eat and with whom you could or could not eat. And Israel had endured centuries of scorn and persecution by its pagan, by its pagan neighbors by adhering to those laws. But these were a matter of life and death for Israel. They helped define them as a group. But in a vision at Joppa, when a sheep was let down, a sheep containing all sorts of animals, some of them unclean, Peter caught sight of the limit of his limits. Rise, kill, and eat. Peter had indignantly replied that he had never been guilty of eating unclean food. No, not me. Oh, well, you know, I've followed all the rules, got it right. Well, it was not just a, a challenge to some arbitrary man-made boundaries. These were boundaries that everyone knew that had been set by God. And the core beliefs that shaped Peter's life since earliest childhood were being challenged. But the voice and the vision came to him, not once, not twice, but three times. Three times it said, rise, kill, and eat. When he awoke, there were men sent to him from a Roman officer, Cornelius, a Gentile member of the very army which now had so terribly oppressed and occupied Israel. Peter went and met Cornelius and was surprised to learn that the risen Christ had sent him there. He baptized Cornelius. He ate with him. Peter saw that the vision and the voice were not so much about unclean food as about making distinctions about unclean people. Don't call anything I have created. This is a blanket statement. Don't call anything I have created. Whether it's food, people, no, do not call anything I have created unclean, said the voice. Now, what did this mean? Peter told them that through the vision he had learned that what had given to them as Jews in Christ, namely the pouring out of the Holy Spirit and the presence of very presence of God in their lives, had also been given to the Gentiles. Imagine the shock. Israel, who had been chosen, who had suffered terribly through, down through the ages, precisely because of their being chosen, and those who had observed the law, they are now told that the promises of God given to Israel now belong to the Gentiles. Who are these young upstarts? These people are pagan. They don't eat. They don't. Well, it took a while for Peter to come to this reality. It took a trance. It took two visions. It took angels and the Holy Spirit to lead him into a new way of thinking. And the narrative ends with all at the true first church at Jerusalem, glorifying God. And they heard of Peter's story and the saving grace of God that had been given to the Gentiles. Now, on its face, it sounds as if change has occurred, but just read a little more in Acts, <laughs> and you will see. We have to question just how much the church welcomed this idea this change in limits, this shift in boundaries. It was a new paradigm that would affect how they lived, their practices, and who they related to in their daily lives, even right down to what they ate. Do you think that was easy? Having the limits, the boundaries shifted, who moved my cheese? <laughs> we did it, what happened? Whoa, whoa, you know? Read a little deeper in Acts and you'll see that it didn't just come off just like that. Paul and Peter had their issues. They really did. And defining and 
discerning a direction for the life of the church, given this new reality. Well, what might this lesson mean to us? You know, we live in a world of distinctions as well. Some of them are sensible and helpful, like people with good grades get into better schools than those with bad or mediocre grades. I mean, that's something we could say. Well, if you study hard, you make, we make a distinction there. Uh, people who work hard deserve to get promoted faster than those who slack off. And we know that's the truth in, in today's world. But some of the distinctions we make are more harmful than helpful and not at all reasonable. What we might not, while we might not use the words clean and unclean to describe people on either side of the boundaries we set, our society also has its implicit purity codes, its own ideas about who is in and who is out, or who is deserving and who is less deserving. Depending on your orientation or your thinking or a paradigm, the unclean might be illegal aliens, it might be gays or lesbians, it might be Muslims, it could be Democrats, it could be Republicans, <laughs> especially in this environment that we're in today, certainly. Some of the mightiest and most painful struggles in our history have been over distinctions that we make among people, certainly. In the civil rights era, a black person sitting down at a lunch counter was seen as a provocation, an unacceptable, even illegal crossing of a boundary. However, God makes no distinctions. God shows no partiality. And that is at the heart of this text. There is no distinction, Paul says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I would add, there is no distinction for all are created in the image of God. We're all the same. All have sinned. And all have access to the overwhelming grace of God, God through Jesus Christ. The church of Jesus Christ is where the old boundaries are broken. And if you insist on maintaining them at all costs, Peter said, you could be hindering God. Well, the church has struggled with this radical notion since its very beginning. Struggles over the ordination of women, certainly that's been at the heart. In fact, in the mid-90s, I was serving a congregation where there were two daughters of the congregation in seminary, and the leadership of the church wanted to have a vote whether to allow women in the pulpit. <clears throat> and I'm in that meeting saying, why are we talking about this? This is who we are. That was decided many, many years ago in the 70s. Why are we? They went ahead with the vote and it passed by one vote. One. Wow. Think about that. And also struggles uh, continue over sexual orientation. And there are just the latest chapters in the ongoing struggle over boundaries. The United Methodist Church is getting ready to go through all that themselves. Presbyterians have been through it. We Lutherans have been through it. God shows no partiality. These struggles are not going to go away anytime soon. We will probably always find something that will challenge our understanding of what is appropriate and where are the limits and where are the boundaries. Bishop Will Willeman tells of a story uh, and while he was serving at church, they had determined that they wanted to reach young adults so the church brought in a church consultant, a specialist in youth ministry, and she asked in her first session with the leadership, if I were to go looking for young adults on this Friday night, where would I find them in this town? And Will said, well, we didn't know. But then someone sheepishly spoke, well, I guess this, that would have to be the red armadillo, sort of like the silver bullet out here, you know, <laughs> and go to the red armadillo out on the edge of town. Let's all go there this Friday, set up shop, and see who the Lord sends us. Then there were questions. What? Good Christian, respectable folk like us going to a place like that? <laughs> well, the church was willing, willing to welcome them, but only if they came to them. Now, see, that's an old attractional model. Build it and they will come. That is a cultural model. Build it and they will come. 
But as a matter of practice in this case, the church needed to change its boundaries of what its relationship to the world was and to segments of the population. To be inviting to engage people where they live and work and to invite them into life, into Christ, into community, in this case, <coughs> meant change and risk. Doing things differently. Change is difficult. And if not embraced, it can come at quite a price. Peter Steinke, a mentor of mine, said, you know, people love the idea of change. They just don't like the reality of it. <laughs> you know, it's easy to think about change. But actually embodying, you know, incorporating that into view, practice, action is another thing. The church has always struggled with this. For example, uh, organs at one time were banned in churches. <coughs> they were not allowed. Now for many, you can't even think about church without an organ. Or at least, you know, uh, you, you can't think about organ, you know, uh, organ music being part of the landscape. <coughs> many, many other changes. Or... Uh, different race, races worshiping together. Uh, I was in a, a congregation years ago that um, an African American man was turned away at the door of the church. Well, they turned the pulpit over here to do this. <laughs> turned away simply because he was black. I raised the roof on that one. Absolutely, with leadership. Because that is not who we are as a people. Period. Many other examples. Um, I know using technology is another deal. Some folks just go nuts over it. Well, we, when my last congregation at St. Lawrence, uh, we, we, had, we received a gift for technology. Um, and we installed this. Oh, there was wailing and weeping and moaning. Oh, Lord, the church is never going to be the same again. We've lost it. Oh, we... Well, we, we went through that and lived through that. And then there was a time when our technology was down for about three weeks. Oh, there was weeping, wailing, and morning. Oh, please get it back. Please get it back. You know? We struggle with change and acceptance. Fred Craddock, a Baptist preacher, tells a tale about a church that he once knew. He remembered it as a status church. When Fred was a boy, everybody who was anybody <laughs> went to that church. Not just anybody could walk in there and join. It was, it had, there was a high level of income expected, proper attire, seeing the membership requirement. Needless to say, people of color, any color, need not apply. As you might imagine, First Church did not receive many new members. Members simply grew older. And as an adult, Fred, Pastor Fred Craddock, later learned that First Church had closed. There were too few people of the, quote, right type. Fred tells of going back to that town, and he discovered that the old church was still standing, but now it was a restaurant, a fish restaurant. <laughs> he walked into the big Gothic doors, and sure enough, where there had been pews, now there were tables and waiters and diners. He looked down, the nave of the old church and where the communion table had once stood, and now there was a salad bar. He walked out the front door back down the steps, muttering to himself, now, I guess, everybody is welcome to eat at the table. Whew. How tragic is that when you think about the resistance to change? There is a question lurking for us behind today's text, and that is, will we allow the Holy Spirit to prod us today, to give us a vision, to drag us, as it dragged our apostolic forebears before us, kicking and screaming, all the way toward the wideness of God's mercy and mission of the world? Or will we just hunker down right here with folk just like us, and continue to do the same old, same old, safe and secure, no change, boundaries firmly fixed, 
with boundaries firmly fixed about who we are and what we do and how we behave? Will we dismiss the Holy Spirit to go on elsewhere, the instrument of God's living presence in our lives? And then I the other questions to consider this day. Who is it that we go to to share the gospel? And where is it that we go? Who is it that we invite out there to come worship with us? Who is it that we welcome here? What boundaries need to be looked at and examined and life together to be a more open, welcoming congregation? After all, we're called to show no partiality. We're called to share God's love with the world. We are, show, we are called to show the wide acceptance of God towards all. So what habits or practices need to change so that we can be more hospitable and welcoming to others? Questions for us all. stand as you are able, excuse me, and join me in hymn number 377, Alleluia, Jesus is risen. Of all that is seen and unseen, 
We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all of creation. Loving God, lead us to follow your spirit rather than our own prejudices or desires as the church cares for one another. Open us to perceive your gifts in those we least expect. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Inspire us to praise you through the beauty and the majesty of the natural world around us. Urge us toward more deliberate care of the world you have made. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Humble the rulers of nations before your splendor. Direct them to the people who need their attention most, and turn them from the temptation to hoard wealth or power. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hasten to dwell among those who are in pain, or distress, as we especially pray for Ruby, Cliff, Anne, John, Ruth, Judy, Gary, Jeremiah, Rachel, Robert, Colleen, Donna, and others that we name in the silence of our hearts. Come up alongside those who are grieving to offer them support and comfort especially the, fa the family of Anna Childers and others that we name in the silence of our hearts. Lord Jesus, remain with those experiencing despair and need. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Place holy love at the center of all our relationships and communities. By your love, heal us, convict us, and renew us. Bring an end to racism in our churches and communities. Let everyone know your goodness by the love we show one another. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us a place in the diverse company of your beloved saints. Teach us the value of each person's identity and bless us with a shared identity as your children, kindred of Christ. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your mercy, O oh God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you.
Would you please stand? <laughs> Living God, you gather the wolf and the lamb to feed together in your peaceable reign, and you welcome us all at your table. Reach out to us through this meal. Reveal yourself to us. Show us your wounded and risen body, that we may be nourished and believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. O God, most mighty, O God, most merciful, O God, our rock and our salvation, hear us as we praise, call us to your table, grant us your life. When the world was a formless void, you formed order and beauty. When Abraham and Sarah were barren, you sent them a child. When the Israelites were enslaved, you led them to freedom. Ruth faced starvation, David fought Goliath. And the psalmist cried out for healing, and full of compassion, you granted the people your life. You entered our sorrows in Jesus, our brother. He was born among the poor. He lived under oppression. He wept over the city with infinite love. He granted the people your life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this. For the remembrance of me. 
And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his death, we cry out, Amen. 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 Celebrating his resurrection, we shout, Amen. 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 Trusting his presence in every time and place, we plead, Amen. Amen. Oh God, you are breath. Send your spirit on this meal. Oh God, you are bread. Feed us with yourself. Oh God, you are wine. Warm our hearts and make us one. Oh God, you are fire. Transform us with hope. O oh God, most majestic, O oh God, most motherly, O oh God, our strength and our song, you show us a vision of a tree of life with fruits for all and leaves that heal the nations. Grant us such life, the life of the Father to the Son, the life of the Spirit of our risen Savior, life in you, here, now, and forever. And now we are bold to pray the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever.
Would you please stand? May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, generous God, for in this bread and cup we have tasted the new heaven and earth where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God, the author of life, Christ, the living cornerstone, and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please join me in hymn number 543, Go, my children, with my blessing.